I'm not one of these uh, <coughs> over emotional North Carolinians. <laughs> kind of distinguished and all that. I don't know how you get out of this meeting without squalling. Last two or three days. I want to. It'll be this will be the last time I get to address you folks. Uh, uh, I'm not preaching tonight, and actually I'm glad for it. <laughs> I wanted to say that uh, I don't know, boy. Get up and to say that it's been good is just not doing it justice, you know. And I guess the, the worst part of it all for us preachers is y'all treat us like a royalty, and we ain't royalty. Just not. Uh, we appreciate it. I appreciate it. It's not that we can't use the money, but we don't deserve it. We sure don't deserve it from one spot. And we appreciate your generosity and all your prayers and so on. Appreciate all the compliments and all the sermons and all that, but it ain't it ain't us. It's the Lord. This would have been a dry, thirsty land this week without the Holy Spirit. Let's uh, open up our Bibles to Mark chapter 12. Mark 12. Mark 12, verse 28. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth. Amen, Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord. You said it right, man. For there is one God, and there is none other but He. Verse 33, And to, to love Him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And no man after that durst ask him any question. Let's bow our heads and pray. Now, our Father, been through three days of this now, gotten a lot. Father, by Your grace, we pray that You'll open up the gates of heaven now, the windows of heaven this morning again and tonight. pray that every heart here might be open. You might give us intentness. pray, Lord, that You would not allow any of us to walk from here deluded, deceived about ourselves or anything else. pray You'd grant us the liberty and the unction, the illustration, all that we need, Father, to do justice to Your book this morning. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now, he said there in verse 34, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And if you're a student here and been going to church of this church, there's no need for me to go into long, uh, drawn-out detail about the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven and all that. You know well enough that the uh, kingdom of God is not the same as the kingdom of heaven, and neither is it a synonym for heaven itself. Uh, suffice it to say that it is a spiritual righteous kingdom. It's a kingdom that dwells within the Christian. Uh, in that kingdom is the Holy Ghost. And suffice it to say that uh, salvation and heaven and the new birth and the love of Christ and uh, the new creature and all those things that we have, the blessings from God, can't be severed from the kingdom of God. But uh, you don't just, uh, you know, the, the kingdom of God is not strictly heaven. We are recruited in this world by the Key Club and the Kiwanis Club. I get people sending junk to my house there about three days a week, new, new Visa cards and new Master cards and trying to get me deeper in debt than I already am. Have the young Republicans calling me and the middle-aged Republicans and the old Republicans want me to give them money, you know, and then the new Democrats and the Socialist Democrats and the old Democrats and the Liberal Democrats and all that stuff. If it's not one bunch that's after me, it's PETA, the, the, the tree huggers and all that junk, you know. Everybody's recruiting. Yet nobody wants in the kingdom of God, and there's not many people recruiting for that. I want you to know the kingdom of God is like no club or anything that you could ever join. If you miss out on that and join everything else, you've missed everything. Was it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? 
There are things that make it different from any of the rest of that. First of all, it's necessary. I don't need the young Republicans. We could flat sure do without people for the ethical treatment of animals. But you need to join the kingdom of God. It's necessary. Except the man be born again and can't even see it. Furthermore, the benefits are marvelous. All the Republicans want your money. And then they're going to lead you into one world order anyway. Say, what are you? I'm a Democrat. Uh, wait a minute. No, 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 I didn't mean to say that. I'm a Republican. But I'm a loose one. I don't wear that coat around very much, you know. Third thing about that thing is it's tough to beat the fellowship in the kingdom of God. Now, he said here in this passage that this man was not far from the kingdom of God. There's some things that that implies. First thing it implies is that there are some people that are nearer than you would imagine. Old uh, Lazarus lay in that rich man's gate with the sores oozing. He's so weary and sick, he can't even shoo off the dogs. Homeless. Somebody might have walked by him and said, Boy, that looks like an old drunk. Looks like somebody dying of AIDS. That old boy went to sleep and woke up in heaven. Woke up in paradise. There's some people nearer than you think. Well, one time the Lord Jesus Christ looked those Pharisees in the eye. He said, let me tell you something. The sluts and harlots go in for you do. The crooked politicians and the uh, socialist Democrats that are saved go to heaven for you do. Some people nearer than you think. Can't always look at things from the outside. That's what the Lord told us. That penitent thief hung up there just as naked as the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, he didn't look like he was going to inherit a kingdom. But praise the Lord, he did. <laughs> Nearer the kingdom of God than you think. Well, there are a lot of cases like that, you know, throughout the Bible. I mean, uh, there are times, you know, the scuzz balls and the flea bags go in before anybody else does. Now, the other thing that that little uh, phrase there implies is that there are some people farther away than you think. I mean, that rich man uh, over in Luke 16, uh, it doesn't look pretty good for him. Well, that rich young ruler comes to the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 19, and he says, what do I do to inherit eternal life? And the Lord said, keep the commandments. And he named off some commandments. He said, well, all these I've kept from my youth up. He said, well, there's one thing y'all lack us. And that young man walked away on his way to hell. He's a good man. Better than you. You didn't keep as many as he did. Probably still don't. That young man walked away on his way to hell. That uh, unpenitent thief that hung on the cross there with the Lord Jesus Christ and the penitent thief. <laughs> well, he looked just like the penitent one. I mean, from the outside, there wasn't a thing that looked different. If, if that guy could go, then that guy ought to be going too. But he wasn't. He died and went to hell. Some people are farther away than you think. Old Paul and the Pharisees thought they had it made there before, uh, you know, Acts chapter... Nine, Paul got saved. Looked pretty good. And things were going good. I mean, we were, they were holy and going on, you know, so on and so forth. They were just about as holy as you get. And you can say what you want to say about Pharisees, but pretty rough to live that, that close. Good men. But they were further than the thought. And then there are some people that are near and yet far. Old Herod and Pilate stood in the same room with the Lord Jesus Christ. And they were so near, but they were so far. Boy, in Acts chapter 17, it says that uh, he's not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. Amen. But there's a bunch of us that are that close. There, and, and we're going to heaven, but there's a bunch of people that close, and they're going to die and go to hell. Boy, it said in one place there, the Lord Jesus Christ is weeping over Jerusalem. And he said, you didn't know the time of your visitation. He said, I came and visited you. He didn't even know it. Came and walked your streets. The Son of God, the Word of God incarnate, the Messiah, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the eventual Prince of Peace. He didn't even know it. He'd be near and far at the same time, man. You know what we do? We lose perspective on how close the kingdom of God is. We get so tied up. We get so tied up with our bills and our necessaries. 
We get so tied up with our possessions and our ambitions. Those The world just sends out its tentacles and just crunches you in, you know. You can't hardly get away from it. Let me say something nice for this morning. Your dreams are not sacred. Oh, boy, these days, you know, if you stomp on somebody's dream, you committed the unpardonable sin. When I left a, a roadrunner to, to go full-time in the ministry, they wrote me up in their little newsletter there, and all, you know, the positive stuff and everything. So, all, Kyle Stevens leaving us after a couple of, you know, however many years of service and so on. Going to go build his dream. Going to be a pastor of a church. I just thought, it's not a dream. It's a calling. And some people, people have been uh, programmed to think these days that if they've got a dream, that makes a dream sacred. It's not sacred. The kingdom of God's sacred. You lose perspective on the kingdom of God by chasing your silly dreams around. Some of your dreams aren't fit for a dog. Chasing them around, ruining your life, and spending time that you'll never be able to retrieve. We'll lose perspective on the kingdom of God. The Bible says in Romans, it says, now is high time to wake out of sleep. For now is salvation nearer than we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. We're nearer the kingdom of God than we believed. Well, the Bible says in Second Corinthians chapter 6, now is accept the time. Now is the day of salvation. The kingdom of God is nearer than you thought. I'd like to bring you just uh, four thoughts here this morning on that. Here in Mark chapter 12, this fellow, this fellow has some wonderful attributes. For instance, verse 28 there, he says, he perceived that he had answered them well. Well, he perceived wisdom. That's better than a lot of people do. Perceive the wisdom of God. Furthermore, he went on to say there that he did real good with those two great commandments. Looks like, looks like to me he's following those two great commandments pretty good. He said, amen, Lord, that's right. Can't do any better than that. Then it said there in uh, verse 32, it said, And the scribe said, Well, uh, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other but He. He said, Amen. Lord, anything you say, Amen. Well, those are, that's good things. But this fellow wasn't in the kingdom of God. He was just near it. Being near it's not the same as being in it. Uh, Nicodemus might have been uh, near it back there in John 3, but he wasn't in it. Get a little further on there, and you like I said in uh, Matthew 21, and it says that the publicans and the harlots uh, go in for you Pharisees and Sadducees. And it says the reason they go in is because they believed. Now, let me tell you this morning how close the kingdom of God is. It said down here, it says, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. Well, first of all, I want you to know that the kingdom of God is just, just on the other side of belief. It's right on the other side of faith. Right over there. It's not far. Just right on the other side of faith. Just right on the other side of belief. Kind of like old Hagar and Ishmael back there. And you know how they laughed at uh, Abraham's son and uh, Isaac. And you know how <coughs> old Sarah <coughs> got upset and the uh, Lord said, Okay, Abraham, better listen to her this time. Send him away. And boy, she went away with her boy. And that boy was crying and wailing because he hadn't had any water. And she laid him up under a tree there, a little old bush, and walked off a bow shot so she wouldn't have to hear him cry and starve to death for water. And the Bible says the angel of the Lord heard that boy's cry, and he came down and talked to Hagar. And said there, he said, he opened up Hagar's eyes, and there was a well. The well was just right there. They were going to die out there in that wilderness, and the well was just right there. There are some folks that are going to heck go to hell, and you know all they had to do is believe. Just right on the other side of belief. Just right across the veil. Read about old Abraham. He stood out under those stars, and the Bible said, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Well, that's not so hard. It's not as hard as trying to live it. <laughs> You're not far from the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is just right across the veil from belief. Just on the other side of belief. Just on the other side of faith. That's where you find the kingdom of God. 
Boy, I read about old Cain. You know what makes people far from the kingdom of God? Whatever keeps you far from believing. Old Cain watched Abel's sacrifice be accepted and got mad because his own sacrifice wasn't accepted. He stood there in his presumption for bringing his fruit when he knew it took a lamb. After being told it took a lamb. He stood there in his pride and that old boy couldn't be told what to do. You know what will send you to hell? Not allowing somebody to tell you what to do. I mean, he stood there and gritted his teeth and rocked his brother's brains out. And really, he was not far from the kingdom of heaven, from the kingdom of God at all. Just right there. Can't nobody tell me what to do. Not even God. Read about old Thomas. One of the apostles, one of the men of God, he said, except I thrust my hand in his side and feel those prints in his hands and his feet, I will not believe. I won't do it. I will not. You know what kept him from believing there for a while? His will. You know what a lot of people say? They say, I just can't believe it. No, you won't believe it. It's just not that hard. Some idiot preacher from Texas can believe it that was stupid enough to go north. You can believe it. There's some people in this room that can't multiply through the multiplication tables and they can believe and get to heaven and you say you can't? You won't. You won't. You say, you're not supposed to lambast sinners. People have been trying to love you in for years and you won't go. Go somewhere else and get a cupcake. You won't believe. And so you won't go. Well, I read about Herod. Herod wasn't that far. I mean, old Herod stood there and he had had John the Baptist preach to him. And boy, that thing got rough, but, you know, uh, he still liked John. And finally, that old wicked Jezebel, she got things going and got him back into a corner where he felt like on his political honor that he had to kill John, and he did. And boy, he started hearing about the Lord Jesus Christ. He goes, oh no, John the Baptist come from the dead. And boy, it finally went along there to the end of the, <clears throat> end of the Gospels. And uh, there is uh, Herod and uh, or the Lord Jesus Christ before Pilate, and he finds out that he belongs to Herod's jurisdiction. He says, oh good, I'll send him to Herod. And Herod said, who you, got, who you sending me? He said, I'm sending you that Jesus character. So oh, good, I've been waiting to see him for a long time. I've desired to see him. I've desired to hear him. And boy, he came in there, and Lord Jesus Christ just stood and looked at him like the brother said the other day. What kept Herod from the kingdom of God? He wasn't that far. Well, he wouldn't be reproved either. Wouldn't listen. Balaam wasn't far from it. God speaking out of his mouth. The Lord's prophet. Yet for covetousness, he went back and went to hell. Thou art not far from the kingdom of God, but whatever keeps you from it, whatever keeps you from belief, brother, will keep you out. i will send you to the lake of fire instead. Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. It's just right over there. It's just right over there. It's just right over there. Right on the other side of belief. It's just right there. I'm in. I'm not in. I am in. I'm not in, but I can go in. I am in, but I can't go back. Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. It's just right on the other side of faith. There's another thing I'd like to note along this line. Look at Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, verse 20. Luke 17, 20. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall you say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is, with, is within you. It said over in Romans that it's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And, and I'm not talking to you lost people now. I'm talking to Christians. 
And I've never seen a day when, uh, of course, you say you hadn't seen that many days. Well, you're right. But I've read a lot. And I've never seen a day when there were so many disenchanted and despairing and suicidal and half insane, uh, depressed, powerless people that are saved. People that are in the kingdom of God. People that have the Spirit, regardless of what the charismatics say. People that uh, to whom the kingdom of God ought to be real. And they're just defeated. And yet, if you like that this morning, thou art not far from the kingdom of God. You know, we read all the time about uh, people dying in a, you know, a pauper's apartment, you know, and a, them finding a, a mattress full of money. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. People dying and you know, having lived on sardines and crackers for years. And, you know, they got CDs and bonds and stuff laid up that would feed any 15 of our families. You know? And you say, boy, that's ridiculous. Say, boy, that's nuts. There are people all over probably this church with their families caving in and things going wrong with their wives and their kids have purple hair and you're worried about that boy that your girl's running around with, and you're worried about that girl your boy's running around with, and seeking to rediscover your self-image and trying all this New Age malarkey and spending thousands of dollars a year on seminars and every gadget and gadget that comes along. You snatch it up like a fool trying to you know, improve your self-image and this, that, and the other and trying to help yourself out of whatever problem you've got. You know what you're doing with that thing if you're a Christian? You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You're out in the backyard by that old four-foot in diameter oak tree that you need to cut down for the next hurricane blows it over on your house, and you're out there with a, with a butter knife hacking away at that old bark and griping all the time you're not getting anywhere through the tree. In the meantime, you've got a McCullough chainsaw in the garage underneath a tarp that you forgot about. And it's all gassed up and oiled up, and all you got to do is pull the cord, and you don't remember you got it, so you can't use it. You know why Pollocks don't like chainsaws? They say they're too heavy to use, and the chain keeps getting stuck. That, my friend, is Christianity. Bunch of Pollocks. That's right. Oh, Elijah. Oh, Elijah's gone. Elijah, Elijah's standing there with Elijah's mantle. Man, what in the world do I do with this thing? And they've crossed the Jordan. He asked you back on the other side. He said, He said, Lord, where are you? He said, Where is the God of Elijah? Ooh. He said, He says, And the Lord says, What are you yelling for? He said, I didn't know you were so close. He said, you never asked. Well, that's the truth. Some of, the people, some of you people ought to be ashamed of yourself. This is the first time you set your foot in this building this week. You don't, you don't understand what's going on here this morning, do you? People yelling and crying. That guy getting out, that punky player getting up here and crying before getting through a song. Man, you know, what is this? Well, you ain't been through what he's been through the last three days. out there hacking away with your stinking chainsaw like a Pollock. And he's got his engine going. He's going to finish off that four-foot oak tree in about 15 minutes. And you're going to be hacking on it till the day you die. Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. Folks, a Christian has what he needs. 
You don't need God. You don't need all that seminar crap. You don't need all that philosophy and that education and that career career advancement stuff, you know. And you don't need to be sensitive and you don't need to be trained into the intricacies of it. You have got what you need. There's a guy, I think he was a soldier in Germany, an American soldier in Germany, and he went, uh, got out of the army and made a, a real good friend over in Germany with another, with a German sh- soldier. And uh, he got out of the army and a couple years later his, his German friend came over to America and visited him. And the American was a Christian and the, the German guy was, was, a, was, was lost, was an agnostic or an atheist or whatever, it didn't really matter. Six of one half doesn't another. And uh, on the way from the airport, the Christian fellow looks at his friend and says, uh, Listen, I've I got a, a couple of books ordered at the Christian bookstore. And he said, I need to stop by and get them. Do you mind? No, I don't mind at all. So they pull in at the Christian bookstore and they go in. And while uh, the, the guy's up there at the, the, the front paying the clerk for his, uh, his, his books and stuff, the, the, the agnostic, the German, he's... Uh, I'm sorry about the German being the agnostic, brother. But... He's back there and he's walking down the, you know, the rows of books and he, he finds the how-to section. I hate how-to books. I despise how-to books. I'd say, the only how-to book that I like is Brother Pearl's book on oh, no, Tramp a Child. I had not had a chance to talk to him yet, but anyway. But anyway, so they got this how-to section. And it's, you know, stacked 15 deep and 30 feet long. It's how to do this and how to do that, you know, and how to keep your dog healthy and everything else. You know, Christian bookstore. And uh, in a minute, you know, here comes a here comes a Christian friend down there. He's got his books under his hand. He's ready to go. He said, "You ready to go?" He said, "Yeah." He said, "He said, what is this?" He said, "Oh, he said that's a you know that's a that's a book section on self help and and you know how to how to." He said, "Don't you Christians not do nothing?" <laughs> that's the truth. We have this treasure in earth and vessels. He's given us the uh, power of love and of a sound, a spirit of uh, fear and a, or a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. What, what do you want? What are you shopping at, uh, you know, a junk store for when you can have the best? Why are you getting your meal out of a garbage can? When you have a T-bone steak, what are you doing? Thou art not far from the kingdom of God, man. It's, it's even now present within. But that's not all. I'd like to take note of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians 5, 6. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is just beyond the threshold of the mortal. Boy, the moment that ticker stops ticking, the moment that aorta lets loose, the moment that, that artery up in that brain lets go, man, you are there. I've always wondered how long it takes. It says to be asking the body, I, you know, I, maybe it's boom like that instantaneous. You know, you know, I'm here and then I'm there. I've always wondered if there's maybe four or five seconds where you're going, hmm. <laughs> you know, I don't buy all this light at the end of this tunnel stuff. I'm not talking about that, but I'm not... You know, just just that light. It'd be just like the Lord, you know. Uh, you know, right after you die, just to leave a, a seven-second interval. Because the Lord's got to have you live by faith one more time. He's going to test you that one last time and stick that knife and go ee like that. Say, warmer. Brother Rowley over in Bismarck, Dave Rowley. He had a guy die in his church here this, I guess it was last month, maybe it was two months ago now. 
And I told you about him a little bit the other night. His name was Knutson. He left behind, he's a 40-year-old man, left behind a wife and, I forget, five kids, something like that. And some of them were little kids. A good man, man. He got a, he ran a, a nursery, four or five nurseries in Bismarck. Just about all the businessmen, a bunch of people in town knew him. And they knew he was a Christian. As a matter of fact, uh, the, the Bismarck uh, paper gave him like two pages, man, of a write-up. And uh, he told them, he said, uh, you're going to put in, when I, when I talk about the Lord, you're going to put in there what I say or you're not going to write on me. And boy, it, it was, I read it, it was good. Brother Raleigh said that the last few days was terrible pain, just horrible. And he was in there the night that Brother Knutson died. And uh, he was reading the Bible. And he was reading in 2 Corinthians 5.8. He said, we're confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. He looked over at him and he was gone. Lord, have mercy. What a way to go. Well, I heard about something about somebody here not too long ago. and They said that he ate supper. Went in there and sat down in his lounge chair. Laid his head back. Took a nap and never woke up. Hey, man, my mom and dad died of cancer. What a way to go, man. <laughs> Sit down and just be gone. You know, when somebody dies like that, I uh, I like to sit down and just go get alone, you know, and sit there and think and say, boy, now he was here. He was here yesterday. He was here an hour ago. He was for, for Brother Rowley. I mean, he's looking at that dead body. He's going, man, that guy was here ten seconds ago. And he ain't here no more. He's somewhere else. <laughs> Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. Amen. It's man, it's just beyond the threshold of the mortal. When that mortal ends, boy, that's where it starts. Man, that's 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 really something. I mean, I've known Rex Harrison for a number of years. He's been my friend for years. We went through all that mess some years ago. Uh, with all the church split and stuff, he knew how discouraged I was. And boy, every month, every single month, pick up the phone. How you doing? <laughs> Fine, brother Rex. How are you? Brother Keck did the same thing. And uh, we had brother Harris has been through our church quite a lot. And I saw yesterday when he and brother Patterson were going to sing and. I've watched Rex uh, cripple around for years, five, six years. We live in a split-level house now, and so when Rex comes in the front door, if he's going to go to the basement, he has to go down, and if he has to go to the living room, he has to go up. Don't have any ch choice but to climb stairs. Watch him climb stairs, the most painful thing I've ever seen. I saw Brother, Brother Patterson yesterday, Brother Rex come up the stairs, and if you saw him, you saw he, he wanted to help him, but he, there was nothing to do. You know, he's trying to figure out how he's going to you know, do this. I've got this vision of heaven where, you know, I got, uh, I kind of got the, the sanctuary up there, you know, maybe sitting on that, that crystal, that ice, you know, and, and, uh, maybe spanning, you know, a couple of hundred thousand million light years or whatever. And there's that big old rainbow that goes all the way around the throne. You see up there and there's that, you know, that bright light on that center. And then off to your left and to his right, there's a more discernible figure. With that crown on his head, you know, and uh, all this beauty and this glory and everything, and 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 to get up there. Now I don't know that it's true. Probably ain't. But I have this this myriad of stairs, just like in Washington. You know, they're just stairs on top of stairs where you're climbing up these stairs to go in the sanctuary. You know, to for choir practice. There's just this just this mass of stairs, and of course. We get to heaven and nobody's climbing stairs. We're transported upstairs. You know, it's like a, it's like a built-in automatic escalator. You know, just fly upstairs. You don't have to climb the stairs. And we're going to choir practice, all of us. And you know, we're you know scoozing up those stairs. And we look back, and Brother Harrison's down at the bottom of the stairs climbing them. Says, Harrison, come on. 
Y'all go on. So Harrison, you've been here a few hundred years. Ain't you learned yet? You can fly upstairs. I want to climb stairs. I want to climb two stairs at a time. I want to climb three stairs at a time. I've been able to climb stairs since I was four years old. Bless God, I'm climbing stairs. You tell the Lord to get started with choir practice, because after I'm to the top, I'm flying down the stairs and climbing the stairs again. Just on the threshold of the mortal, man. Just beyond the threshold. There's the kingdom of God, just right over there. Got a... I told you about that nursing home ministry we have. There's a young man. There, his name is David. And uh, when, you, when David comes in, he's the one that's he's always got somebody carting him around. and He's the one that has this, I don't know what's in it. I don't know. I don't know what's in it. But uh, this milky looking stuff always dripping, you know, into his veins. And when he comes in, you greet him. Say, hey, David. And his reaction is nothing ever more than like that. He'll come in and, like I said, preach to him about heaven for a little while. And boy, when you mention heaven, he goes like that. Walk over to that wheelchair. His arms are strapped down, you know. And he smells. And sometimes his catheter comes loose and there's urine on the floor. And walk over there and on his, on his uh, tray there, on his wheelchair, there's pictures of David uh, uh, taped down. And one of them has David on his dock with some lady holding a fish. And David's going for the picture. I'm pretty sure David's saved. Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. As bad as it gets, man, it's just just on the other side of the mortal. Just right over on the other side. That veil's not hard to tear. That's one veil that's not hard to rip. Some of you guys, you think that you're invincible. I got news for you, man. It wasn't but yesterday I was 17. And I'm 34 now. And my knees hurt. And I can't play uh, hockey anymore. This veil ain't hard to rip. The kingdom of God's just on the other side. Just right over there. Lastly, First Thessalonians. Just on the other side of belief, even now within you, just beyond the threshold of the mortal, and lastly, just past the trump of God. Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. A lot nearer than you think. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. One sound away. One single moment in time. And it's all over. One sound, and it's all over. We were, uh, Brother uh, Peacock got us all broke up last night talking about his dad's uh, situation and told the day before about his dad's death. I've been acquainted with death. When I was, before I was born, my mom was still a little girl. My great-grandfather, her grandfather, had cancer on his face, and it was eating his face away. And one night when my mom and her sister and her parents went off down the road to have a birth, excuse me, a birthday party, my uh, great-granddad laid out a bunch of newspaper on the floor and laid down on the floor, took a twenty-two and went. That was before I was even born. Then, when I was a little boy, 
must have been only six or seven. I can barely remember the old man. My best friend's name was David Townsend. Lived across the pasture. One day, they drove down the road to his granddaddy's, and they found his granddaddy laying out in the driveway. He'd been clean. He'd been doing something with a 22 rifle, and had set it in the car, in the out, sticking out the window of the of the car. And uh, somehow the thing went off and blasted him. There's a little girl. When I was in the third or fourth grade, I got saved, like I said, when I was ten. They made us promise at that Southern Baptist youth camp that we'd go back that next week and witness to somebody and try to win somebody to Christ. So I went back and I pulled aside Cindy Parker and I witnessed to her and she got saved. It wasn't a year later. She was riding her uh, little Honda Trail 70 down the road to her grandma's house and she didn't look. She turned across that road and she got smeared all down the road, man. They said that, that same day that it happened, some of the neighbors came down there with some buckets of uh, laundry detergent and old stiff, you know, broom brush and poured that sudsy water out on that road and washed up the road so her parents and her grandma and grandpa wouldn't have to drive by the blood of Cindy Parker every time they turned in their driveway. Then my granddad died. My, not my great granddad, my granddad, my daddy's dad. He died of cancer. He fought it for a few months and then succumbed. <clears throat> I never will forget. I don't know, I must have been 10 or 12, 14 then. I never will forget. He had an old dog, a Border Collie. We had cow dogs back in Texas. Border Collie's a cow dog and a big, beautiful dog. And that old dog just sat around and mourned. And they said that long after Granddad died for months, that old dog would sit out by the road night and day looking for my Granddad's red Ford pickup coming down the road. The neighbor came back, and that old dog just dried up and died. It's my first year in Bible college, my mom died. She got cancer. She smoked her whole life. I knew that she had cancer before we I came off to Bible school, and one night... Uh, somebody got me out of bed, Brother Gent. He said, to your, your parents called. You, We've already booked your flight. Rowena's already called. So I went back home and flew back. I had to fly back through, you know, New Orleans or I forget, Atlanta or whatever. And me and my sister, by, by that time that I got back, Mom was real bad. The doctor said, you have to keep a watch on her day and can't let her out of bed. If you let her out of bed, she's going to rupture and bleed to death inside. So we sat there by that bedside for three or four nights in a row, and Mom would, Mom would uh, she had cancer in her bladder, among other places. And uh, she thought she had to go to the bathroom, but it was just the bladder squeezing in on that tumor. And she'd try to swing her legs out so she'd get up and go to the bathroom. She's about half there and half not there, you know, with drugs and stuff. And we'd have to catch her feet. Say, Mama, you can't get up. You can't go to the bathroom. And, boy, she'd get so frustrated. Finally, she said, Damn you kids! Let me up and go to the bathroom! That went on for three or four nights, man. She died. I was my first year in the ministry. Was a guy in our church, real good guy. Boy, he was a blessing. He and his wife were on a trip and were in uh, Michigan, and so happened that weekend, me and my wife were in Toledo with Brother Sal's. And the last night of the meeting, we got a call and said something terrible's happened. Uh, Brother Tutant got killed in an auto accident. His wife was in the accident too, but she's all right. And what had happened was they were driving down this Michigan road, and this uh, this uh, mobile home carrier truck and a, dragging a 70-foot mobile home behind him. He took a turn too wide, and the front cor left corner of that mobile home took out the driver's side. And his wife said that, that he looked at her 
after it happened. And his whole the side of his neck was just torn away. It was a, uh, as best I remember, it was a closed casket. casket you know, and the whole side of his neck was just torn out. And he said he, he looked at his wife, who was right there with this, what, what happened, you know, and then died. There was this old lady. She started coming to church. Her name was May Crowley. She found us out. We'd go pick her up. And she was real old. She always wore this funny hat. It had looked look things like feathers on it. And it was, it was like a sock cap with feathers on it. And she'd come in church, and she'd sit there, you know, and nod off to sleep, and those feathers are going on top of her head. That old woman liked to drove me bats. She started going senile, and she lived in a home with her husband and his, uh, I started to say stepwife his second or third wife and all his stepkids, and they all hated May because she was in the, in the way. Boy, she, I can't tell you the number of times I got to call at four in the morning. She'd say, you're late. When are you going to pick me up for church? i say, May, it's four in the morning. It's in the morning? i say, yeah, it's four in the morning. Oh, I'm sorry. So when are you coming to pick me up? Finally, it wasn't long after that that she died. And I went and they just had a, 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 as little and as inexpensive a, as possible funeral for her, you know. She, uh, they just had her there and I stood up and preached to about three of them and made them all mad. And they gave me $20 and patted me on the behind and sent me out. <laughs> after I got out in the ministry, then my dad got cancer. Cancer runs in my family, man. My dad got cancer. And it, that went on for, Lord, I, I guess it was only five or six months. But, boy, I was, I was still driving a uh, courier when I got the news. And I knew that he had surgery that day. And I called home. And uh, they had done surgery on him. And I said, so how did the surgery come out? And my aunt said, oh, it's malignant. Boy, my stomach just turned over. Because I remembered mom, you know, and how that went, how hard that was. The four hardest hours that I've ever spent in my life were four hours spent. Two at my, up north they call them wakes. I guess down here, I think, if I remember right, in Texas they used to call them visitation. Somebody dies, you know, everybody comes and stands around the body in the casket the night before the funeral. The four hardest hours that I've ever spent in my life for the two hours of each of those wakes, they call them up north, visitations down here, standing by the casket of my mom and dad with two and three and four and five hundred people filing by, giving their condolences. Good night, man. What a horrible experience. There's this lady that we used to go pick up her and her son at our church. And they, the boy got mad because I uh, rebuked him on something, and he huffed off and kept his mom out of church. And I got a call here a few months ago. said, my mom's in the hospital. Would you come see her? Sure. I went down there, and I walked in the room. It was a double room, and I glanced, you know, at the first lady and didn't recognize her, so I figured it was around the curtain. So I went out, boy, I didn't recognize her. I said, man, I got the wrong room. And when I turned back, she was waving at me. She said, I said, Trudy, boy, I didn't recognize her. Her old abdomen was swollen up and everything. She had been nursing a tumor in her, in her abdomen for, for a long time. Never had gone to the doctor. Two days later, she was dead. I have a friend back home. His name is Barney Riley. That fellow I was telling you about the other night, old man, been a consistent witness for a lot of years. Used to be a big old strapping guy, about an inch taller than me, about as broad as me. He's down to about 100 and Lord, 110 pounds now. I'm going to do this funeral whenever he dies. It can't be much longer. I have an aunt and uncle. I used to have a lot of fun with them. I'd go down to my grand's during the summer and spend the night. I'd walk down the road about 200 yards to their house, and she'd always make me homemade candy. And she's kind of a, a mothery, you know, slobbery type and everything. And Lord help you if you brought your girlfriend home at... Christmas or something. You know, oh. <laughs> she 
She and her husband are up in their 80s now. They're both in a nursing home. They don't even recognize each other. Alzheimer's. Just babbling idiots. Familiar with death. Oh, joy, oh, delight. Should we go without dying? No sickness, no sadness, no dread and no crying. Caught up in the clouds with our Lord and to glory. When he receives from the world his own. Oh, Lord Jesus, how long, how long till we shout the glad song? Christ returneth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Boy, just on the other side of that trumpet. Brother Atley, you might never have to see it. <laughs> I tell you what, I got cancer on both sides, and I don't want to lay in that bed and die like that. I tell you what, man. God will give me grace. I know He will. But I don't want to go through that. I'm a stinking chicken. I want the easy way. I want it easy. Brother Peacock said the banjo flips his switch. And I have to tell you that one of the things that I got appreciation for down here that I didn't have before was Dr. Ruckman was always talking about classical music, and I got to listen, of course, to ad lib. And well, I got gradually gathered together a little over 200 CDs now, and they're all Baroque. Just about. And boy, I put old George Friedrich Handel on there. And he wrote something back in the 1600s, 1700s called the Messiah. Boy, there, you know, I told you I'm one of those distinguished types. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't get up and holler and shout and run much. Mostly I just sit there and my eyes leak, you know. I. I can't get much beyond that. <laughs> but boy, oh, George gets a couple of other Germans in there. And that guy starts singing, Behold, I tell you a mystery. And that old, you know, I can't sing like that. We shall not all sleep. We shall all be changed. Keeps going in a minute. Here comes that trumpet. Bum, ba, ba. Bum, ba, ba. Bum, ba, 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 ba. Boy, I'm telling you, I'm just sitting there. I'm just leaking. I'm just leaking, man. And my wife walks in down, uh, you know, my study downstairs, I don't have it all finished, and she kind of flips that curtain aside and looks in. I'm sitting there. She goes, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God, man. There's somebody lost in here. Let's uh, dispense with, uh, you know, all of the, would you raise your hand and would you do this? Would you come down and trust Jesus Christ as your Savior? He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that cometh to me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. What's wrong with him? Tell me one thing that's wrong with him. Would you come down this aisle and trust Jesus Christ as your Savior? Amen. Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. Let's bow our heads. Dr. Ruckman. Lord Father, we are thankful once again. get a little vision, a little taste of what you've done for us and what you will yet do. We pray this morning you'd smite the hearts of sinners and saints in this place. In Jesus' name, amen.
Now, if folks going to stand and say, no, it's a little bit late this morning, but don't be in a hurry to get out of here. Now, wait a while. So you know, rush for the back there and rush for the out the door. Let's stand and sing a couple of stanzas. 248. Give somebody here a chance. Give somebody here a chance. Now, if you're here this morning, 248 in the hymnal, if you're here this morning, you're unsafe. I know the Lord deal with you about this matter, and you ought to get it settled, and you ought to get it settled now. You don't know when you're going to go, when the Lord's going to come. Now is the time. But we're going to sing Why Not Now, 248, 248. We're going to sing three stanzas, and that's all, three stanzas. I'll be somebody to meet you at the front when you come, and just like Brother uh, Kyle Stevens said, just come on. Just do what's right. Come on. God will bless you. God will, God will honor the, the decision. Why, 248. While we pray and while we plead, Why not now? We tell people over and over again, you can't make a mistake in receiving Jesus Christ. And you can't. You can't. The best thing you ever did in this life was accept Jesus Christ. The next best thing you did was confess him openly before men. The next best thing you do is try to win somebody else to him. That's all there is to life. You say, Rugby, you don't know much about life. I know more than I'd care to talk about. And the best thing I ever did was receive Jesus Christ. The next best thing I ever did was get out of that thing and come down there and say, I'm on his side and I'm one of his. And that's about the best thing I've ever done and led somebody else to Christ. Let's sing second stanza. You have wandered far away. Do not risk another day. Sing it. I the Lord to speak to your heart. Come on and step out. Step out. Let Brother Donovan be with you here at the front. Come on. Why not now? I don't know where you are, but the Lord knows where you are. Show your colors. Come on. Come on. This old man he was talking about was old man Shavers lived here in town. Nicky Shavers, his grandson. Uh, Brother Shavers was married to the same woman for uh, 55 years. No, 65. 65 years. That's a plutonium anniversary or uranium or something other. <laughs> 65 years. And one Sunday after dinner, he went in and lay down on the couch and got laughing. And his wife said, what are you laughing at? He said, I don't know. I just feel so good. I just never felt this way before. And she went back to the dishes, and five minutes later, he was dead. Absent the body, home of the Lord. Old man Duck died up there in Bay Manette. Uh, Ernest Duck's daddy was an old-time Methodist preacher. I thought died up there. He was out in the backyard there in the, under the mimosa trees in a wheelchair, and he said to his boy, he said, I'm going to leave you today. And Ernest said, well, call the doctor again, Daddy. You've been saying that a couple of days. And the old man said, yeah, but I'm really mean it this time. I'm going. He said, we'll get a doctor, Dad. And they got the doctor, and he came down and gave him some stuff. They were sitting out there drinking iced tea, and old man Duck suddenly, his eyes lit up like he was looking over the Atlantic Ocean, the sunrise, and he said, My, my, that sure is a beautiful room. And, and then he turned to the doctor, and Ernest said, What made me say that? And he said, I don't know, Daddy. And about a minute later, he turned around and said, Well, bye-bye. And he was gone. <laughs> Now, brother, let me tell you, if you can go like that, you got it made, man. You got it made. But maybe you won't go like that. Maybe this thing here eating that shot. I don't know how you're going to go. For God's sake, brother, sister, if you're out there and you're on the save, get the thing settled. So no matter what happens, you'll have grace for it. A terrible thing to suffer like that for months and months and months and all hooked up like a vegetable and then go to hell. What a way to live and die, man. Come on, I'll do something. We're going to sing one more stand. If you don't come, we're going to close. It's going to be it. Come to Christ. Confession make. It's for you. We're talking to you. I'm not talking to a bunch of saved people here this morning. I'm talking to you on the saved people if you're here. I'm talking to you. you. Come on. Do right. Come on. Come to Christ. Come to Christ, come fashion me. 
you're going to come, come on, whosoever will, let him come, take the water of life freely. You going to come? You going to come? Maybe it's now or never with some of you. I don't know. If you're going to come, step out. Step out. Does anybody here know of any unsafe person who's here today? I'm not going to ask you to identify them, but do you know of somebody unsafe here today? Will you raise your hand? Got a hand in one of the buildings? There's a hand there. Anybody else know of any unsafe here today? Well, maybe they're not more than a couple here today. Well, I got this funny feeling. A, of course, you can't go with feeling, but over in there and back in there, about maybe three quarters of the way back, you, know, you get very different impressions at times. And uh, there's some here need Christ. I don't know why people in America are like that today. Well, I'm sure I know it's the mess we've been getting through the last 20, 30 years. But you're losing your character. You're losing the place where when you know what's right, you can't do it. And in a mob, in a, bo in, a, in a bunch like this, you're afraid to step out. And so you feel like you're making a fool out of yourself. Of course, I don't understand that. It, it never bothered me to make a fool out of myself, you know. I mean, and when it comes to step out from the mob, I, if I'd step out no matter what, what was going on. I've been up. Is it embarrassing to you or something? To let people know that you love somebody who loved you enough to die for you? Folks talk to me about not enough love, not enough, not enough love. What about you, man? What about just love stuff? You know somebody loved you enough to die for him, and you don't love him enough to come down here and tell people that you belong to him? You talk to me about love? I've been in congregations. I've been in congregations with 4,000 people there, and they were standing and singing the battle hymn of the Republic. 4,000 Christians. Temple Baptist Church up in Detroit. I wouldn't get out of my chair. And I wouldn't sing. <laughs> I sat there. You see, you look like a perfect fool. Who cares what you look like as long as you're doing right? You're doing the right thing. What do you care for? We're going to close. I'm not going to beat you anymore. But, but if you know it's right to accept Jesus Christ, you sinned against God in not doing what you knew was right to do. The sign out there says, have you rejected him again? God help you. Oh, I'd be back tonight now. We'll close out tonight at uh, uh, 6 o'clock and come expecting a blessing. And I know you're going to get one. I know you've got one already. you got several of them. you got a dozen of them. You've been here for three or four days. How many haven't missed the service? Let me see your hands. Haven't missed the service. There's about half the crowd here. How many you didn't miss more than two of them? You missed uh, only two of them. Let's see your hands. That's about the rest. Well, that's the way to get a blessing. Just expose yourself to it. Just... Just get under it, just soak it, man. It'll do something for you. You say, well, I did last year, and I got, yeah, but you need a bath once in a while anyway. <laughs> once a year ain't enough. <laughs> All right, both Donovan will dismiss us in prayer. Amen. 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 Lord bless you. Good morning.